Good morning. Welcome to Woodland Summer Series, Reaching for the Stars, a celestial church adventure. And what an adventure it promises to be. And I'm so glad that you've chosen to journey with us this morning. You know, back in 1969, Judge Abner McCall, who was then the president of Baylor University, gave a talk. It was entitled, Change and the Unchanging. And in that talk, he talked about all the things were cha that were changing at the time, especially educationally. He compared that, though, with that which was not changing, and that is the love of God. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the dramatic changes going on in our own society, even here in the church. And we're going to compare those things with that which does not change, and that is the love of God. It promises to be quite an adventure, so buckle up and let's go. Our first session has been called, How Do We Land Here? Uh, the Evolution of the Church. How did we get here anyway? Well, I've always been infatuated with the future. I grew up reading the novels of Jules Verne, and Jules Verne and his imagination took me around the world in 80 days in a hot air balloon. He took me to the moon via rocket, and he even took me 20,000 leagues under the sea in a submarine. His fertile imagination, by the way, gave birth to all those things, because we do all those things these days, don't we? But it gave this particular mind something to think about, to think forward. About the same time, space exploration was really taking off. The Russians had put satellites in orbit, they call them Sputniks. They even had put a man in space, Yuri Gagarin, the first person in space. We Americans weren't too far behind. And in 1961, Alan Shepard went up as our first astronaut, 11 miles into the stratosphere. He stayed there for an astonishing 15 minutes. <laughs> well, we caught up with the Russians and we even passed them. And in 1969, we put men on the moon. I remember it quite clearly because I, it was a summer job. I was working in the oil fields. I was in Metairie, Louisiana, and we had a lunch break. I was in a cafeteria, and there on the television there, they showed clips of Neil Armstrong taking that very first step, one small step for man, one large leap for mankind, and I was mesmerized. Strangely enough, there were people in that cafeteria who said, you know, he's not really on the moon. They're out in Utah. They're just scamming us for the money. I laughed then and I laugh now, but what an amazing thing. How the world is changing so dramatically. I caught a whiff of that years later when I was in Tyler, Texas. The women's, the oldest women's Sunday school class invited me to a brunch. And what a brunch it was. It, it, tablecloths, cloth napkins, silver, china, crystal, and all kinds of wonderful food. It was a great morning. At the end, uh, we were having dessert, and I just asked a simple question, how did you all get here? And one woman took me literally, and she said, by covered wagon, of course. Mom and Daddy, we got as far as Abilene, and Daddy said, I'm not going any further. And he turned around and came back to Tyler. And I thought, well, I would have figured that out a lot sooner than Abilene. But whatever, I started thinking, what a life these women have lived. They've seen us move from covered wagons to the moon. Covered wagons to the moon. Well, the future is approaching us. And it's important, it's imperative that we began to think into the future. And I want to think about that, especially when it belongs to the church. What is it? What does the future hold for the church? I want to start off by talking about four particular changes that are taking place in our lifetime. Actually, monumental changes, earthquake events. The first one is the movement into a technological society. The first three epics of human history, the nomadic, the agrarian, and the industrial, evolved in a glacier-like manner. We didn't see them coming and we didn't see them leaving. They moved very slowly. But this fourth epic, the technological age, is moving with lightning-fast speed. 
I mean, the technological age has come upon us almost overnight. And that's why so many people my age are struggling, scrambling to try to keep up. We took, we began with manual typewriters and moved to electric typewriters, to move to computers, to cell phones, to Facebook, to Google, to Twitter. Uh, I've quipped with my kids, you know, I'm one technological, you know, advancement from becoming obsolete. I have to work hard to keep up, and I keep up by keeping up with my children and my grandchildren. Who knows what's going to happen techno uh, not what, what's going to happen next technologically. A good depiction of this is found in a book called Future Shock. It was written by Alvin Toffler years ago, 1960s, I think. And he wrote in that book, it's been observed, for example, that if the last 50,000 years of man's existence were divided into lifetimes of approximately 62 years each, there have been approximately 800 such lifetimes. Of these 800, get this, fully 650 were spent in caves. Only during the last 70 lifetimes has it been possible to communicate effectively from one lifetime to another as writing has made it possible to do. Only during the last six lifetimes did masses of men and women ever see a printed word. And only during the last four has it been possible to measure time with any precision. Only in the last two has anyone anywhere used an electric motor. And he wrote this in 1960, and the overwhelming majority of all the material goods we use in daily life today have been developed in this, the 800th lifetime. Things are changing and changing dramatically. Maybe another example is, is work, works here. From the time of man's existence, beginning of man's existence to 1850, the body of knowledge, everything that we know about everything, doubled one time. From 1850 to 1930, in just 70, 80 years, it doubled again. And then from 1930 to 1950, it doubled again. And then 1950 to 1960, and now it's doubling every five or six years. That means that if you knew everything there was to know about everything in five or six years, you'd know half that much. A ramification of this is can be seen in artificial intelligence. All of a sudden, robots are real. From vacuum cleaners to artificial clerks and banks and grocery stores, to self-driving cars. Robots are not a thing of the future. They're here and now. R2-D2 of Star Wars fame is no longer science fiction. It's fact. What I mean is that there have been some dramatic breakthroughs and there are going to be even more dramatic breakthroughs. And occupationally, we're going to have to relearn our how to live, how to make our way in the world. In just a matter of time, assembly lines, clerical work, accounting, even medicine, and a host of other jobs will be obsolete professions. I mean, just think about it. What if someone figured out how to make a scratch on a computer chip and all the accounting jobs were obsolete? Or what about if someone created a robot that could become a nurse and would take care of patients seven days a week, 24 hours a day, it's just amazing, isn't it? And just think about all the other things. Just think about medicine, for instance. I don't know if some of you watched, but six years ago, 60 Minutes did a segment along with Charlie Rose where they went to the University of North Carolina. It was the med school there. They went there to observe a computer by the name of Watson. And they put Watson in this medical school to become a resource for all the doctors and all the nurses and all the medical people there who are working there. Watson was brilliant, is brilliant. Here's an example. Did you know that there are about 8,000 medical papers written every day? And now nobody could ever read all those papers. Well, Watson can. Watson can d digest those. And so Watson stays on the cutting edge of what is happening. 
What's more, if you put Watson along with some other doctors and they start diagnosing patients, Watson is always much more proficient at that than even the human doctors. It's just pretty amazing because things are changing. And is it, could it be any wonder that instead of going to see our doctor in the future, we'll just plug into the computer or go to a cubicle in the mall or someplace else, something will scan us and then the computer will say, listen, Mike, you've got the mumps or you've got an infection here or you've got allergies there. Wow, it doesn't take long to realize that things are changing at a rapid rate and the ways that we go about life are changing. Now, I don't say that to be cute or even to be threatening. I just say it as a fact of life. Things are changing and we need to be ready for that, especially in the church. Well, there's a second movement and that is moving from the movement from marathoners to sprinters. And what I mean by that is that people in my day and time were programmed to be marathoners. That is, we were trained for one job and one job and one business that we stayed at for the rest of our lives. That's no longer the case, is it? Because my children have become sprinters. They change jobs, they change vocations, they change businesses left and right. As a marathoner, I was programmed to delay satisfaction. That is, we would buy something, and Lisa would always do this, buy a, an antique, and we would pay on it and pay on it. And when we had finally paid it off, then we would take it home. It was ours. Now, all we have to do is click on to Amazon. We order what we want or what we think we want. We pay it with a credit card, which is another story altogether, and it's here within 24 hours. People no longer have to wait. The forerunner to this way of thinking, I think, was a man by the name of Albert Schweitzer. He changed the world and he changed his own world in so many different ways. He started off by training to become an academic. He got a PhD in philosophy and he was the principal of a college. But after a few years, he became infatuated with music. He switched to music. He went to Paris to study the organ with Vidor, and he became the world's foremost authority on Johann Sebastian Bach. But it wasn't too long before he was encouraged to think again about what he was going to do with his life, and he went and began a doctorate in theology. And then after all of that, he went back to medical school where he was trained and prepared to go Lamba Rene, where we remember him most for. Schweitzer was a harbinger of things to come. We're moving from marathoners into sprinters. But there's also a movement that calls for us moving from empire to clan. Empire to the, to the clan, hierarchical to the congregational. An example of this is the Roman Empire stopped at Hadrian's Wall. And how were they stopped? How was the empire stopped? By clans, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. Uh, the popularity of the Star Wars movies is clans taking over for the empire or from the empire. Vatican II saw that and the Catholic Church and especially our current Pope sees that. And that's why he is out going to all kinds of different places because he realized it's not just the church in Rome, but it's the church all over that matters. There is one final movement that I'd call attention to today, and that is the movement to the enamorment with the stars. And I'm not talking about Hollywood here. I'm talking about heaven, about the stars up in the skies, up in space. Kids are being born today in a perspective that they live in the middle of the stars. Most of us grew up in a pre-Copernican kind of world where we felt like the whole universe revolved around the earth, that revolved around us. Our kids have grown up in a world where they never knew when there was not Star Wars or Star Trek. The world is all about them and it's much more complex. Read the book Bewilderment by Powers. Or if you want to go interior, 
Read the Code Breakers by Isaacson's, where he talks about that in each of us, there are all kind of constellations, millions of cells. And what this means, I think, is that whether you look through a telescope or through a microscope, this world is infinitely more complex than we could ever imagine. J.B. Phillips was right years ago when he wrote, your God is too small, and our understandings of God are way too small. We need to roll into the future to imagine even greater or grander. Which brings us to our scripture lesson for the morning. It comes from the verses at the end of the second chapter of Acts. It says, All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute their proceeds to all as any who had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to the number those who were being saved. We're talking about the beginning of the church. And the beginning of the church was already becoming radically new. There were women in that upper room. Do you remember that? Mary and others. That was quite radical for women and men to be praying together in that day and time. And then you add in Gentiles. And then you add in eating unkosher food. Things were changing. The church was being formed. And it was being prompted by the Spirit. Paul described it by being in Christ Jesus. Now, there are people who say to me from time to time, I want the church to go back the way it was in the first century. And I'm quick to say, I don't think you want that because the church in the first century was undergoing great stress. For one thing, they were being persecuted by not only the Romans, but by the Jews. And this persecution pushed so much that they were pushed out of Jerusalem and into the four corners of the earth. Remember what Acts 2 said? And Jesus had said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. The church was pushed out. It no longer had the temple. It no longer had its Jewish moorings. It was out in the world. And each church became unique. Sometimes we think that the church was franchised like Whataburger or Wendy's or McDonald's. No, each church was unique in its own way. They had their own mission. They had their own ministries. That's why Paul wrote all those letters. Those letters were unique pieces to unique churches. These churches had not only distinct missions, but they had their own forms of theology. The early church was like an amoeba changing shape and changing form. And it wasn't until 312 Common Era when Constantine baptized the, his soldiers into the church and essentially baptized the church into the Roman Empire, that things became structured. The Roman Catholic Church all of a sudden began pulling things together and saying, okay, this is the way we're going to do church. But even with, church, even with that, theology was varied all over the world. That's why we had all those councils. Was Jesus human or was Jesus divine or was there some kind of hybrid there? Over and over, it continued to bubble. Those 300 years began to move in when the Roman Catholic Church began to move it into some kind of form. But in 1054, the Roman Catholic Church split. And some people went east and became Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, and the West became the Roman Catholic Church. But in another 500 years or so, the Roman Catholic Church split, and there were all these Protestant denominations that splintered off of the Roman Catholic Church. One of those was the Baptist Church. We were on the far left end, liberal end, I might tell you, In fact, we were considered radical because we believe that no one can tell us what to believe except Jesus Christ. No priesthood in our believing here. We believe in the priesthood of every believer. And that's what made us so remarkable and so unique. 
The church continued to evolve, though, because in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, the church became overwhelmed with evangelism, revivalism, and it took different shape and different form, and it followed us into the end of the last century. But now the church is beginning to move into post-modernity, and we're going and looking at things a little differently. Churches are now mega churches or very small contemplative churches. In fact, church planners, church historians tell us that they think that we are going to ultimately then end up where we first began, into house churches like the early church was. Well, the early church, the church has been undergoing change for a long, long time. And how we see church really is so much cultural because where we are and what we see around us matters a great deal. But the church is changing and we need to see that. And in the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about the changes that are taking place in the church, in education, in worship, in fellowship, in mission, and in evangelism. And, and this morning, I could tell you about the ch changes that's happened in the church in my day and time from my perspective of how we used to be in church on Sunday all day long and then in church most of the days of the rest of the days of the week. But I I'm not so much interested in telling you my story. I want to hear your story. Therefore, I've prepared some questions to stimulate your discussion in your classes. So go there, friends. And let's discover about the future of the church. Let's travel together. Brave journey. Brave journey.